Welcome to Studio Visits with SilverEye, where I get to talk in depth with some of the most interesting contemporary photographers working today. I'm David Oresik, the Executive Director of SilverEye Center for Photography. You can visit us online at silvereye.org to learn more about all of our programs, and you can also find a fun, helpful glossary with more information and links about these conversations. We took a few weeks off from the Studio Visit series so we could work on our benefit auction, and I'm happy to tell you it was a huge success. I want to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who helped with the auction, especially the artists who donated the work and everyone else who made our auction more than just a fundraiser, but an amazing exhibition and an opportunity to celebrate the amazing community that is SilverEye. We look forward to bringing you more of these studio visits on a mostly bi-weekly basis from here on out. Okay, on to the show. In this episode, I spoke with Dion Lee. Dion was born and raised in New York City and now resides in Oakland, California. She recently completed her MFA at California College of the Arts, and she exhibited at Silver Eye last fall with her mentor and friend, Aspen Mays. Her work uses photography, collage, appropriation, and abstraction to explore ideas of the American landscape, race, and climate justice. And I just wanted to add a quick note about the timing of this conversation to add some context. Dion and I recorded this at the end of May, just before the protests for racial justice and against police brutality began. So while I believe her work has a lot to say about this moment, we don't address it directly in the conversation. I love talking to Dion, and she was really generous to share some of her newest work with us. We got to go deep on how she fell in love with the natural world, why she's fascinated by wilderness survival techniques, and how quarantine has altered her art making. Enjoy our conversation. Dion Lee, welcome to Studio Visits with Silver Eye. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> the first question I wanted to ask you, um, if you could, you know, maybe put this in your own words. One thing that was really, I would say, kind of revelatory for me when I was talking to you about your work was the connection that you had made between the African American body and the American landscape. Um, and how that's driven a lot of the work you've created in the past few years. Can you kind of explain what that connection is and, and how you made it? Yeah. Um, well, I think for me, first it started off with my own like slow personal interest in um, the natural world, more specifically in like plants and like I was, I'm like an amateur herbalist. Um, and I grew up in New York City where there's not a lot of like open green spaces, but I was really in my young adulthood, <laughs> I was really interested in like going around the city and like learning all the plants, identifying all the weeds and just um, <clears throat> getting into that. But I think where when things started to shift for me is kind of like a little bit of a loneliness I felt in that where I just felt kind of like I didn't, there weren't a lot of um, other people I felt like I could, I could connect with they were interested in the same things which of course actually isn't true but it was just felt difficult for me to find that at the time mm. and so I started to also think about my own journey into like becoming interested in nature and wilderness spaces and kind of my own discomfort in those spaces which definitely is partially like growing being, being a city kid and growing up in a city and not like having um, a lot of access to those sorts of spaces growing up when I really like thought about it, I I realized like, oh, this is like a, this is actually well, related to like ancestral trauma, which is like, this isn't just something that's like, I'm a city kid, so these spaces are weird. It's like, oh, actually, you know, throughout the history of this country, people, black people have been subjected to obviously like forced labor and then also violence like on, um, through like wilderness spaces. So you think about forced labor in terms of like, People, when people were enslaved and, you know, ha having to grow crops for other, for white people basically to, to make money to, for capital, right? And then um, acts of violence that took place in those, in like the deep woods because no one would know, or also at that point, no one cared. So you're, you are, you know, you are a New York City kid um, or were a New York City kid. You grew up in New York City and you got interested in, well, tell me about how, how did you get interested in being in nature, being in wilderness? I'm trying to think of, figure that out actually. I grew up across the street from Central Park. So I think I definitely had this like, like I just saw green spaces more than a lot of other people. Um, or I was very lucky to live in a place like that. But I think 
you know, I took, to be honest, I took like a foraging class when I lived in Brooklyn and like this guy, um, I forget his name, but he's like a big, a big name in that scene. Um, but he was like, it was like a group of 40 people and we all met outside Prospect Park and he took us through the park and showed us all the weeds and all the, um, other types of like foliage and like what we could eat, what was poison and all that stuff. And I think there was just a moment of seeing all this like abundance, a different type of abundance that I didn't, that I was never aware of, like in a surprising space. And then once you learn, and once I learned certain plants, like I saw them everywhere, whether it was like growing out of like a the concrete in a sidewalk or in an empty lot, like in bed or, you know, um, and it, it kind of just, added this sense of like not to sound corny but a little bit of like hope and possibility or just kind of like cool to be like oh I can I know that this lot that maybe once had a building in it that's now overgrown with this weed actually has like a a purpose you know like I understood its purpose in like a larger ecosystem and also how it could like be beneficial to me um and that sort of knowledge just felt really empowering and it also does connect back to like your first question about um me thinking about the relationship between the black body and those spaces because i think this is just like a general american thing where people don't know like there's like a quote where it's like kids can identify like so like x amount of like corporate logos but no plants or anything like that Mm -hmm. and it's just about like understanding where you are and understanding the full world around you. Um, uh, but I also think back to like, it is tradition and lineage for good reasons and bad that black people once were like experts on this land. This is obviously after native people through like forced labor, we had to learn how to like work the land and work the soil. But it's, it's also always like kind of hard for me to talk about because it's, not the way you want to figure that stuff out (laughs) you know what I mean and like right but I do see power um in that yeah I mean for me that was one of the the really powerful things about understanding your work more deeply was you know and and just the the various levels that you're thinking about the, the landscape and especially this notion that it's been a you know that it's land if it's land in America it's been the site of so much American history in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a part of it that we oftentimes ignore in landscape photography, right? We we sort of think about the Mm nowness of it, but the the history is, feels really present in your work. Yeah, it's like the American history, but really just like deep violence. So I think a lot about, you know, my relationship to it, but I always remind myself that this land, you know, was stolen, right? And doesn't belong to me, even though I feel like I desire some sense of ownership of it because of um, the history of like how many people have lived on this land. So it's, it's like a weird space to sit in. Um, and I think a lot about just, there are great thinkers who um, actually, <clears throat> my birthday was just a couple of days ago. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but my husband got me this book that I've been wanting for a really long time called Farming While Black. And it's um, by Leah Penniman. And she's runs a farm in Albany, New York called Soul Fire. And it's really just about like black um, stewardship of the land. And she brings in a lot of like, um, I haven't read the book yet, but she brings in a lot of like African practices and um, early African-American practices on like working the land. And I just, there is a resurgence happening amongst like this reclaiming of, um, because I also think there was, a, there was a period of time where it was seen as like lower to be black and be like a farmer or work the land or just kind of like, because it, also when you think about like the great migration um, and people being forced into cities or moving into city, migrating cities, and kind of divorcing themselves from this painful, what could have been like a really painful um, time of history, but there's like a little bit of a return to that, which feels really um, empowering because it's happening on our terms. Okay, so you you became interested in in the land, in the landscape, in in photography, through photography, through these foraging classes. Um, but obviously your approach is not to get your eight by 10 camera and drive to Yosemite. Tell, tell me about 
how you came to you know collage and appropriation and manipulation and mm -hmm. found materials like why why did you come to this approach to talk about these ideas yeah i actually i was interested in that idea of kind of like re of critiquing like the history of landscape photography and recontextualizing it so it seemed appropriate not for me necessarily go out and make photographs but to use photographs that already existed and i think the first example of that is the video drafts um, where i'm just going through these photos that i found in this book called the world we live in which is like a life publication that was um published in the 70s or 60s but there also that that period of time was really interesting because in there was this like resurgence of like our interest in our national parks and people visiting them more although not everyone was allowed to visit them um and it's i always point to 1964 actually as a as a year because it's obviously the civil rights act was passed but then also the wilderness protection act and i always found that such a like really beautiful just weird coincidence in terms of how, what i think about in terms of my work um but yeah so the yeah. video drafts i just it's from this one book um but it just had all of these like you know beautiful vistas and scenes and places that felt really unattainable to me for various reasons um but that also i thought a lot about how these places don't even look like this anymore just thinking about like climate chaos and just kind of like the how our world is changing in, in general but yeah i was interested in just like literally remixing them so i just i call this video like a live collage kind of because i at the time also only had one copy of this book and i was so nervous to like cut it up because i was like how i can't i was in grad school like i can't afford to get another copy how am i gonna and i was like didn't want to glue anything but then i realized that there was something really potent in like the fluidity of just switching the images out and seeing what was on the other side of them and just kind of um holding them in my own hands and like just sitting in my own autonomy of like being able to mix them into different like new landscapes basically well there, there's something about this video that that i love which is you know that it's about the land and the landscape but it's also about the postcard and, and the image of the landscape and about <laughs> when you talk about being a kid in new york city and i'm sure like you you saw a lot of these places in books before you could travel to them and like that experience of photography of just transporting you you know to something really beautiful and something really unlike your your surroundings coming back to you the appropriation and photography and the landscape and history and injustice and all these things which are like in a way photography is you know it never like the way that photography never really conveys the whole experience of of a place of a landscape right it's always kind of a a poor analog for Mm -hmm. you know yosemite even with someone like ansel whose project is like making the most you know inspiring piece of paper about half dome you know but it's still a piece of paper in a book do you ever think about like do you ever think about that failure to communicate i guess mm -hmm. of photography when you're when you're working yeah i think i experienced that when i was trying to figure out where my work was going especially in grad school because i did think you know i just moved to california and i'm like great i just need to like I don't drive because I'm again, I'm from New York, but I was just like, <laughs> my partner drives, like just driving these places. I'm going to take all these like landscape photos and it was just like deeply unsatisfying and felt really, um, it was just deeply unsatisfying. And I, and I realized that that's kind of what brought me more into collage and using found imagery because it just, it felt like a lot of, I just felt defeated every time kind of, cause I didn't know also thinking about like the history of California land, like I was really, did not know very much when I moved here, you know, like I didn't, um, it's different from like the American South, which I feel like is what I'm mostly thinking about in my work. But of course, I mean, black people migrated everywhere, but the history in the West is just a, still something that I'm working through, understanding a little bit more. There's a piece of plot that also grounds, which is also, I think, after drafts was a piece where I was like, oh, now I understand kind of what I'm doing. Where again, it's still not quite collage yet because I, I went through this phase where I like could not glue anything. I was just like terrified. I don't know why. I was just like, <laughs> I can't commit. Um, but when I made this 
piece, it was similar to making drafts, except I was knew I was going to make a still image, but I was just like improvising basically in front of the camera and taking lots of photos and kind of like waiting for the right um, thing to happen in which I was interested in this in like inserting blackness into these spaces and not necessarily just as a metaphor for like black people or something, but just kind of like void or um, a portal or some sort of like uh, space that you can imagine another world on the other side or something else on the other side. And I think when I, that's kind of related to thinking just about like the history of landscape photography and and the linear and how, where it is now, which I feel like is definitely with a more critical eye, like generally, um, Mm -hmm. and more of an eye around like environmental justice i would say too and i just when i said that out loud like latoya ruby frazier just popped into my head um of course yeah so i think that's definitely like that and then breaking the fall which is the next piece on that slide um it's a diptych and that was actually made around like the fight around the dakota access pipeline and i was definitely that was like in the back of my mind. I wouldn't say this piece is about that per se, but it is this waterfall being torn out of like a landscape, right? And mm. um, again, bringing in this like black space and this void and thinking about what we were constantly reminded of during that time that water is like, is life, right? It is essential to like all of our survival. And at that time, also in California, there was a, it was the, there was a huge drought going on when I moved here. So I was just really thinking a lot about like, the precarity of that and just kind of just like it just felt really it was just on my mind a lot you know so i know a lot of your work you're thinking about water you're thinking about lots of issues around environmental justice and i love you know they come through in the work like like subtly right they're, they're not you know you know you're never making like posters to like save the polar bears or anything but the influence is is still very poignant how has environmental justice influenced your work i don't know i don't i i again it's things that i'm thinking about i think primarily in my work i'm it's really like i'm trying to figure out my place in it all i see it as just like me asking working through a lot of questions that i have that question the systems that have put me where i am it's something that i think about like moving forward in my work because I it is important to me I think like I think some for some reason like on an aesthetic level just doesn't really come through because it is kind of like really abstracted and all that stuff but I was gonna say I, I you know I, I wouldn't be so sure that it doesn't come through on an aesthetic level I mean I've always thought of the things you're talking about as I mean they're subtle and you know to me you're you're doing something that I I think is like the very purpose of art, if I had to say it, which is like you're asking questions that come from deep curiosities and uncertainties and kind of a, a deep kind of need to know. And maybe one that, you know, that was really, I think when, when you had the silver exhibition, one that I kind of kept returning to as this kind of bringing a lot of these ideas together was a, a, a sequence of six images called Fleet. I know you were thinking a lot about issues of water and issues of landscape and, and Americanness. Yeah, Fleet is, um, like you said, six, there are six eight by 10 silver gelatin prints and it's of a sail um, that I got from an instructional sailing book that I found at a nautical consignment shop in Alameda, California, thanks to our friend Aspen Mays who told me about that shop. Yeah, I was interested, well, the, sum, the summer before I made that, I went sailing with a friend of mine for the first time, and it was like such a beautiful, serene, amazing experience. So I was just like, wow, this is like, I need to do this all the time. But then of course, questions about access comes in and who, you know, and then everyone, so she's like in a sailing club, but it was like this dock with all these boats and everyone like owns these boats. And of course, there are all these white people who own these boats and just like, you know, it seemed, and the people that I was in a boat with were all lovely, but there was this real, like, um, it was just a little bit of an awkward situation because I felt like I was on a boat with very nice white people who, one of them who was one of my best friends, um, but there was a sense of like freedom and like exploration within that, that I just, that felt so remote and foreign to me. Um, I just thought about like the history of people on 
boats and thinking about freedom and exploration. <laughs> anyway, so I was thinking about that. And so I got in, you know, the sit and I found the sailing consignment shop and I was just like really into all the things they had there and just kind of thinking about these tools that have, you know, a lot of them remain, there's advancements in the technology, but a lot of them remain kind of unchanged through history, like a rope, right? Or like mm -hmm. how you get the sail up on your mast, whatever it's called, I don't know. So yeah, so I found this image and I just scanned it um, and saved it in my little archive. And then I went through this motions of like, as I scan the image, I kind of move it on the scan bed to make these really small manipulations. Like I don't, again, very subtle ones, but just to kind of uh, warp this uh, really familiar thing, right? Into something that's maybe, that's recognizable, but seems to have a different spirit to it. And I think it reflects more of that spirit that I was thinking about when I think through history and like what kind of like the fine line between what's a tool for something like positive, right? Like ideas of freedom, like the idea of freedom is not bad, right? The idea of exploration maybe isn't fully bad, um, but there's like a way to, but there's also like uh, on the flip side, like how those things can quickly turn into something devastating for other people, right? Like freedom for one doesn't necessarily mean freedom for another. You know, one of the things that we were talking about too was thinking about these sales and you know, that, that two, those two ideas of like this really freeing, fun, beautiful, adventurous spirit of like exploration and leisure and like, you know, sailing and also, you know, talking about like the, the sails of like the ships of the transatlantic slave trade and, um, mm -hmm. oh yes, yes, you know, like <laughs> the other things that, the that, you know, the other evils that shift but that's about that idea of like freedom but when i say like freedom for one isn't freedom for another it's just like yeah like <laughs> but they were but the people who were bringing you know africans to this country were in their minds they were doing it in search of their own individual freedom not thinking about freedom and like a, you know because they's like yeah i don't know the, the way we talk about the history of this country is so weird because um we just like I feel like on a larger scale, people are so committed to the to just believing in the myth of America and and just like not seeing that as like that's the goal, and we're just like in the process. Like the <laughs> these like ideals of like these American ideals of like everyone can be free or whatever. That's not um, that's not America yet. You know, like that's just it's just not, and probably won't be for a very long time. Tell, mm -hmm. tell me about how you how you came to to become so interested in wilderness survival techniques training yeah well yeah i think that's related to i mean you said this but just to maybe tie a loose bow around it where when i think about this um like idea of like attaining this goal like that is hinged on people's ability to survive or to thrive you know not to survive but to like thrive um but yeah i was interested in it again it's like goes back and forth between just like on a personal interest level where I'm just like yeah I'm into plants eventually when I got into herbalism I realized that this was that was like a survival um skill to know like what's growing around me and how I can use it right um but it's funny just when I think about the wilderness survival because it seems so unnecessary right where it's like we have all these other ways of like being okay or like surviving but I there's a the back of my mind or I just feel like one day it, we might have to return to some of these things mostly when I think about it in terms of like climate change and um, things like that and and environmental injustice do a lot of these things like it's almost like a weird fantasy where I want to be like this prepper person who's like really <laughs> able to just like do all these things instead I just read a bunch of books about them and I do do some things of my own. I went to like a weird retreat um, a summer or two ago where I learned how to make fire from scratch and that kind of really shifted things for me, um, which is like a very difficult thing to do. And I wasn't, I got it eventually, but it was really, really hard. But something about just being able to then create fire from your hands is like a really, it's kind of like looking at the stars, right? It's like this like thing of just like, whoa, like how did, one is understanding your place a little bit, but it's also just like, how did I like, do this thing with my own energy. Yes, and I went to like a this deep dive of just like, <laughs> how do I do everything? Um, 
I mean, I love the I love the story of you going to the survival or they're going to the fire making workshop because I know there's a, a couple of pieces that you've made mm -hmm. kind of literally about how to how to create a fire from some of the wilderness books and mm -hmm. you know that like that idea of thinking about you know when I when I think about the work that you've made that's kind of survival oriented or or takes from these survival books and, and manuals. I oftentimes, you know, it puts me in a place where I'm thinking about a future where all the comforts in, of modern life may not be available to us. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, what if we had to make our own fires or what if we mm -hmm. had to find our own water? Yeah, I'm also thinking about survival as like, I mean, definitely in terms of, of uh, wilderness skills, but obviously thinking about where we are right now and like, <laughs> like the importance of like individual, like being able to survive the moment that we're in and know how to protect yourself. Um, I think it's related. Obviously it's not the same. Um, but just kind of I'm just thinking more like as I move forward and I just feel like the word survival is just gonna become more and more important. And I think about a lot even just under our current like political system and like how hard it is for some people to survive under these conditions um, as opposed to others. So I just see it as a larger metaphor for, for like survival in general. I think also there's this like connect, like particularly in the North, true North pieces, there is this like, again, nod to like understanding how the past is always present and um, these skills, again, like being able to make fire from scratch or being able to like actually see the night sky and then, and, north and true north i'm doing this um positioning which i also learned at that weird retreat that i went to with the fire making class and all that stuff you know there's ways that you can measure the sky with your own hands right so just thinking about being your own compass and figuring out like finding the north star which is what that what i'm doing there well you know thinking about survival and starting a fire and finding true north with your hands and these kind of american myths and dreams i think the, the thing i keep thinking about is the ideal of like being totally self-reliant mm -hmm. and all these skills that are things you do with your own body right things people can't take from you things that if you learn them you own them completely and they become like a part of you i don't have a question there but that's just some no i think that's totally totally a hundred percent true and i feel like um yeah self-reliance and you know, the whole, in that, in going off of that, the whole North, true North pieces are, um, I was thinking a lot about, you know, when enslaved people were trying to move North, right? They had to know how to understand the sky and like find the North Star, right? So that you know what direction to go. Um, but just thinking about, but the reason also there's two of those pieces and there, what the, there's a second one that's uh, true North is just when I also realized that there's these, two different norths there's like the magnetic north and true north and just kind of again thinking about this like myth of just like well what is this like destination that we're like looking towards what is this goal what does it mean that there's two of them and they're not in the same location um like you know it's not i guess it just to me ties back up into the complicatedness of just like how do you attain like how do you reach your goal or like how do you see it clearly and just kind of like the setup of it feels a little bit like a trap <laughs> going back to the wilderness survival pieces like there's the image of the lean-to shelter that comes up a lot too which is thinks reminds me again of like ideas of like a trap um because it looks like one kind of sometimes where it's just like it reminds me of a trap that um like an animal can go under, you can like kick the stick and it'll just like fall down, you know? <laughs> um, right. And I, you know, one of the things that folds in really powerfully to me in this whole conversation is like those, those, those ideas about self-reliance, right, are, are mostly a myth, right? Like even if you can build your own fire and you can do all these things, like no, no one's... <laughs> No one's no one's really that self reliant, right? We live in a society, mm -hmm. people. Um, yeah, yet we also though commit ourselves to this myth of this like the American like individualism, right? Which is also right. just like not real. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I think your work like 
it speaks really powerfully like because on the one hand i think you understand it's not real and you make a pretty like powerful critique of it but on the other hand you acknowledge the appeal of those ideas and like the, mm -hmm. the beauty and the allure of those ideas and there's this ability to hold those two things like those two opposite things as true side by side which is really um i mean really really profound for me yeah i also think that's like there's the only true way to for me personally to feel to like make any sort of not peace but to just feel like to me like full understanding of something comes from like being able to bring those two opposites together and understand how they work together and i think about that even in terms of like of like when i again talking about this like american myth is just like when we're able to truly be honest about you know all sides of our history and like hold all that stuff at the same time like that's a way more interesting and generative place to move on from than just like picking a lane you know what i mean of just i feel like it's yeah i just think it's more generative it's more of a it's a it's a truer launching pad to like try and think about a potential different future you know uh, before we started recording you mentioned because you can't get into the, your dark room because we're recording this during the covid pandemic and all the schools and community spaces are closed for who knows how long you've been um doing a lot of collages with scissors and glue um and not in the mm -hmm. dark room um, mm -hmm. can you can you talk about how how that's come about or, or what that's meant to you in the past couple of weeks yeah it's been really interesting um <laughs> and a little bit like really difficult like i had a period of mourning of just accepting that like i cannot go into a dark room right now yeah i've been now it's like a mix of some slower dalton prints that i was able to make before um the shutdown happened and then like found images directly from books sometimes i'll cut them out directly from the books and i'll scan it and i'll print it off on my like cheapo computer at home i mean my cheapo printer at home and use them so it's a it's all there's a lot of new textures being introduced it's definitely freed me up a little bit to just have to do this anyway it was like okay i have to make work so just like do whatever like we were just like this whatever happens is like what's gonna happen and you'll figure out like where to move from there um but these are all still in the same like thinking about the same topics but i think what's happened in making work in the current conditions is that you know not just for what is accessible to me but just given the circumstances things have gotten a lot looser process wise and more a little bit um rougher the way i'm even cutting paper is very different where i'll even start just like stabbing the exacto knife into the paper and just dragging it through the paper to make a cut and ending up with these like rough edges and just kind of being really into that right now and i think is reflective of <laughs> just like my emotional state maybe <laughs> yeah i mean that, that was one but, thing that i i really loved about these was they they're really kind of raw and mm -hmm. you know i think your work oftentimes goes back and forth between being really elegant and polished and and kind of crisp and having and then other pieces having these kind of rougher edges and like when you said you know there's some anger in there and you're like yes mm -hmm. like i can i can feel it and, but talking to you it seems like kind of intuition plays a big part in your creative process that's becoming more and more true yeah which I'm so thankful for, to be honest, because I also think sometimes in high and mighty art spaces or just like edu like uh, in academic spaces, there's not a lot of like conversation about that part of process. It's really, um, which for me, there's a lot of like research aspect of my process, but I do think, especially working in the dark room, there's so much room for experimentation and to kind of let intuition guide, um, especially in collage too, where it's just like, there's also, there's, there's a, it's a little scary to know that you can make a cut and not always be able to undo it or you just have to like deal with what you did. And I like that. And I like, I like the process of 
you know, if something of working on a piece, like adding, removing, adding, removing, just until it's like right and not necessarily having an end goal in mind and just letting it kind of have its own autonomy feels really freeing, I think, just especially right now. <laughs> to me, the collages are really interesting because they combine this intuitive process that you've been developing and that has this really raw emotional power with this vocabulary that you've built up over the past couple of years of your work that is a very like intense vocabulary. You know, it's talking about rope and race and violence and exploration and beauty and travel and trauma and like it's all there and once I kind of came to understand your work it's like I, I can't you know I can't see rope I can't see sails I can't see water without mm. kind of understanding the beautiful and terrible parts of them and, mm -hmm. and now with these collages you're just kind of setting all these things free in this in this way that's that's way you know in some ways less straightforward but also just really kind of i mean they're almost delirious to me and, mm -hmm. oh my and, uh, god <laughs> I, no that was actually a great word to use and i think that's i think that the process was a little delirious too but i really enjoyed like it was i was i embraced that fully and i'm like really in that space and i it's felt really generative and i think actually the first one um on the pdf because i've been introducing like new other materials like um transparency and like you know color even which has been exciting and i showed this to someone and they're like oh that looks like they said that the flowers felt like gunshots or something through the mm. image or like blood or something or you know are, are something copies? kind of like they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was thinking mm -hmm. about that. I mean, I obviously saw blood and, and anger, but then I was like, the Wizard of Oz and <laughs> <laughs> opium yeah. and, you know, yeah. I mean, a really, yeah. a really poignant symbol. It's also a really, it's, a, it's like a real California plant. Usually it's the orange ones, not the red ones, but um, yeah, and like the other pieces in here, there's a, like, in there, there's cutouts from this like earthquake book that I've always had and been pulling from which is a I think it's called survival and earthquake country or something um but I think in a lot of the work is also in terms of thinking about the wilderness survival and um just like disaster impending disaster in general it is a reflection of my own like fears basically that I feel like I'm working through which is like I am afraid of like what's going to happen to the what's happening to the environment i am afraid of like an earth, a big earthquake happening in california i am afraid of like when i lived in new york i was afraid of like a terrorist attack you know what i mean just like all these like or just like hurricane sandy and like that shutting the city down for as long as it did and obviously not to mention like bigger disasters like katrina or puerto rico or you know more recent um events but I'm just like deeply, deeply afraid. And I feel like that delirium and all that stuff is just like really coming out, especially in the situation that we're in right now, which is not the like disaster or like survival situation I ever imagined <laughs> being yeah. like existing or, or whatever. But I'm just like, it's, you know, there's just a lot of fear. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a situation that's unimaginable and, you know, I'm, I mean, this is, you know, kind of a side note, and I don't know if this is, you know, I, I don't know what to think of this thought right now, but I know a lot of the conversations I've been seeing and, and listening to are like, how are artists responding to the COVID pandemic? And, you Sorry. know, <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, you roll your eyes so hard because I'm just like, I don't, you know, like, we won't, we won't know for years right like i, I think thank you to yeah me, I, I think of the the art you know when you were drawing that distinction between i'm not an activist but i'm active right i think mm -hmm. i think of art as the same way like i think art is art, activism needs to be immediate and fast mm -hmm. to be effective and a lot of art isn't that a lot of artists don't work that way a lot of artists need time and they reflect and they process and they digest and in some ways you know these collages when i think about like what are artists doing during covid you know they're looking for ways to express fear and anxiety you know they're looking yeah, for ways to, 
because what we're doing is we're also just coping like everyone else you know what I mean and I feel like there's this um I've been a little like the reason I rolled my eyes hard because I've been a little like annoyed I think at this like um yeah just like what do you and before we started recording we were talking about this a little bit too like what are you doing what are you working on whatever like how are you like how, are you making work about this yet and it's just mm-hmm. like I don't know I'm just like trying to make things and just trying to process this all at the same time and I do just feel like um and that that's like okay and that should be and that's acceptable and that if you are like really able to dive in and like actually two weeks into this I got like (laughs) someone shared a google doc with me that was like pandemic syllabus like or or no like a reading list or whatever for like covid pandemic (laughs) stuff and like art and i was like how did you do this already this just happened i'm still just like you know checking in on my like i don't know you could be many people can do two things at once and i'm but i'm just not that type of person or i'm just like i i'm just i guess what i'm trying to say is that i'm just trying really hard to reject the notion that any artist needs to be doing anything right now You know what I mean? Uh, or, or I think there's also the, the, the truth, you know, like that any, any creative endeavor you do right now will be true to this yeah. moment, right? Like it exactly. Can, it cannot exactly. not be. Yeah, we're living it. And if that's how you process, that's also totally fine. But I also just think, yeah, it's like, I think it's just me relieving the pressure off myself. I'll just be real. It's about me. I just don't want the pressure. I just don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think, um, I think, I think that's, that's really real and true. Um, <laughs> Dion Lee, thank you so much for sharing this work with us. Thank you for having me today, David. I had a, this was a lovely conversation. <laughs>